left off some water. What can go wrong, right? <laughs> right. Uh, Jan Maarten, Lursma, that's, uh, that's me. I've got uh, various backgrounds. I have a background in the arts and in uh, medical illustration. There's a picture I did. Uh, this is a picture I did of uh, part of human anatomy. I did my, did my PhD here in Enschede at the U Twente uh, about the role of individual differences in learning anatomy and in uh, learning surgical skills. And my day job is in Nijmegen these days, where I train surgeons in a keyhole surgery. Uh, I'm not going to provide like a grand sweeping overview of hardware in medicine, but I'm uh, basically going to talk about my experiences as a maker working at the Radboud University and the kind of challenges and opportunities that arise uh, from there. So simulations for surgery training, it's, it has a long tradition, like already 600 BCE on the Indian uh, subcontinent. The Hindu uh, surgeon Sushruta advocates using gourds, which are like a type of melons with a leathery skin, to practice uh, suturing and not tying. And this is actually done like almost in the same way these days. People use bananas and uh, Oranges, the principle is the same. So you have a very long, uh, continuous tradition of simulation in surgery. Uh, and of course, it makes a lot of sense, right, to use simulation when the skills you need to learn are complex, high stakes, like it's a life or death type of thing, and expensive. And if so, if you can cut off a bit of the learning curves in a safe and controlled environment, that's a good thing. So there's simulation in surgery. And we typically run that in skills labs. Laparoscopic surgery is complex for a couple of reasons. One of the major reasons is that it's spatially complex. You introduce your camera, the laparoscope, and your instruments through, through trocars, which are ports uh, that are introduced in the abdominal wall into the, the abdominal cavity. The belly is blown up with gas. But you work over uh, a pivot meaning if you move your hand to the, to the right, the sharp end of the instrument inside of the patient will move to the left. It, it's tricky. And on top of that, um, you, get, you have indirect vision. Like the, the camera is introduced in the patient, but what the camera uh, projects through a monitor, which is in a very different location compared to the anatomy that you're working on. On top of that, the camera moves during a procedure. So it's not like you make one transition and then you're good for the, uh, for the procedure. You need to dynamically adjust your mental perspective on what it is that you're doing. This makes it spatially com complex. So for laparoscopic surgery, there, is a couple, there are simulators available. You've got the uh, fundamentals of laparoscopy video box trainer. You've got the LabSim virtual reality trainer. These are devices. You've got a big shelf of literature, so it's like well validated. We know that there's transfer of skills from these simulators to the operating room, which is a good thing. However, they are very expensive and not very flexible. You know, it, what you buy is what you get, and you need like. Uh, especially for the virtual reality trainer, you need maintenance. You need like uh, qualified personnel. You need a contract every year. They need to come in to serve you and make sure that it's, that it's still working to a specification, which can make it a bit, you know, a bit of a, a challenge. And also what I want to train basically has to do with spatial skills, spatial skills and damage control. Many people focus on speed when they train. If I'm faster, I'm better. But people get faster, that's kind of trivial. So we focus on damage control and then speed will, speed will follow, basically. And what you see here is that people, basically, their working space is very well aligned with their visual space. So these spatial transitions are not covered in these very expensive machines. That's because when they develop them, 
they rarely get medical personnel in to actually have a go at it so that they can learn from their uh, experience. Uh, so what I did, I basically, I designed and printed a trail car, one of these ports, and that led to the any box system because basically any cardboard box or any dishwashing basin can be turned into a laparoscopic simulator which with these trail cars. And with this system, it's got a camera on here and it's got like trail cars all around the thing. So you can systemat systematically change the difficulty of your exercise. If you got your camera aligned uh, with your instruments, like your instruments are to either side of the camera, is easy. If you turn it like 45 degrees, suddenly it, it's a lot more challenging to do the same exercise. And as you progressively turn the camera, the, uh, the drill gets pr progressively more difficult. Until you meet 180 degrees, then all of a sudden it gets easier because you basically mirror everything and you're good to go. I designed some exercises uh, as well. And basically, yeah, that's flexible. Only sets you back like 40 euros or so in materials. I'm definitely the most expensive part of the whole system. <laughs> And uh, you can easily make versions too. This is a version where I built a laparoscope, the, the good scope, want, because it's very inexpensive uh, to make. And basically you can train uh, in pairs, which is important too. Usually skills training is like a solo affair. In the operating room, you always need to communicate with your uh, team. So here you can have like a camera assistant and like the main, uh, main per person performing the tasks and people will have to negotiate a little bit about how to operate the camera and what is going on in the task that you're doing. Uh, yeah, my work involves uh, some, I often make anatomical models too. I use like MR or uh, CT data sets and I create like 3D models of uh, the relevant anatomy. Sometimes I make molds so I can cast uh, a miniature liver, for instance, in a different material. So it's more like lifelike in terms of uh, texture. And yeah, that's the kind of thing I do. And there's like many labs around the world that work in a very similar way. When I'm on a conference uh, elsewhere, I typically seek out the local skills lab and I have a chat about what is it that you're doing and how, how do you do it. And every, everybody is like tinkering along in a very similar way. So then I ask them like, okay, so would you like to share? Sometimes they can, sometimes they have a page up on their website with a, with a recipe, how to make it. Some of these things I have on various places uh, too. Some of, it, some of it is on, on a GitHub. I think I've got some things on Thingiverse and it's in various places. <laughs> um, and then I'm like, what else would you want to do with it? And then typically the conversation stops short because people will be like, okay, well, but it's intellectual property, right? And we got a valorization department. I cannot just go out and share this with you, with the world. And I, I entered that discussion too with the valorization department at the Radboud University. And they basically are like, yeah, well, you know, you can make some extra pictures and you can do this and you make a business plan and then we will put you in contact with uh, production companies and they will take your design and, and market it. And I'm like, I'm not looking for another job. <laughs> I basically, I want to share this kind of stuff, right? Because I feel that a lot of hardware, a lot of designs are shared in a small way, but what we really need is like user experience, like uh, how do you use that thing, what kind of course does it fit in, and also what kind of, what's good performance on your equipment, right? Like do some research on skills development by sharing that data, and that, that data sharing part is kind of virtually non-existent. It's like the big simulator companies 
are happy to work from a central server, but they keep user data, which rightly belong to the students themselves. They keep it locked up in their databases. So basically, it's like Google all over again, only in a smaller setting. <laughs> you lost control. And you weren't even thinking about it. Right? So this, this, these are challenges. And I'm happy to share these things, but I, I sure hope nobody's going to make any money off, the, off of them, <laughs> because then I'm in trouble with the valorization department. So actually, they provided me, ironically, with uh, a motivation not to make any money <laughs> with it, because then I will get in trouble. So yeah, I would like to do more on validation and usage, but it's kind of hard because of inter intellectual property and valorization issues. Uh, in principle, the people that I talk to, all of them are open to the possibility. All of them would like to get a thing like that going. And of course, the opportunity, uh, it's, it's, fr it's frugal, it's adaptable, you can maintain it yourself. It's also community oriented in principle. These are all, I'm sure you're all very familiar with these arguments and that's what it is like for me in this setting as well. Um, do I have a little bit time still? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Going a bit fast, maybe. Okay, just on, on the off chance that uh, I would go fast, I have a couple of other slides lined up with some other projects that are not, not necessarily tied to my job as a, a skills instructor at the Rabat University. Um, one thing I noticed when talking to our surgeons and other medical doctors is that people can be in pain, right? They have had a procedure, they're in pain, and basically they lie on ward in their bed having pain all day long. Uh, and we know that because pain is measured. It's like every day a nurse will enter the room and will ask like on a scale of one to 10, how much pain do you experience? And people will tell them like today it's a four, today it's a six, etc. <coughs> then I was like, that's not a very satisfying situation. You know, for one thing, the doctor is there or the nurse is there asking. So there's a psychological effect. If there's a person there that can help you, typically people experience more pain. Because if you're not experiencing pain when they're asking, you don't get treatment, right? So the, the being, person being there biases the answer that you get. And also you ask like once, at a set moment, every day there's a lot more once in a day, right? So you might just very easily miss the moment people are actually in pain. And you also, you learn very little about the variation of pain throughout a day. Probably when it's visiting hours, there's a lot of people in the hallway, lots of social things going on, people get distracted, people don't experience pain so much. When it's what quieter, like in the morning, in the afternoon, late afternoon, evening, people probably experience more pain. But we don't know because we don't ask and we have no way of, uh, of measuring it that way. So what I thought of, and this is like the in initial sketch of that thing, is like I was thinking of children in pain. I was like, isn't pain easier to bear if you have like another person with you or an entity with you that is also experiencing pain? So I thought like, why not use a pressure sensor so you can squeeze your hand in someone else's hand and depending on the pressure, you get like a facial, changing facial expression. So you're in pain together. So, which like might lessen the pain, who knows? And also you get an incentive, like you see, oh no, they are in pain too. You get an incentive to kind of like lessen the pressure and maybe downplay your own pain in the process. So that was the initial thought. And then I was like, this is, I have not made yet something that has this many nuts and bolts. It's kind of complex. You've got hardware, you've got software, there's lots of new things to develop. So I was like, I'm going to ask for, for help on this one. And that I did. Uh, I entered a trajectory at uh, the WAG, who had like a medical program at, uh, at that moment. And I got a group together and we worked on this on this project. And it got to a, to a prototype. Like we used a knitted sensor, a sensor that includes uh, some 
uh, electrical wire. So if you squeeze it, the wire is uh, short and you get a different resistance in the, in the process. And it works. This is like a, a graph of uh, squeezing the sensor. You really get a signal that way. So that worked. And then the project stopped and I had a prototype. And I was like, oh yeah, I've got a prototype. Then I tried it again with uh, the Han in Nijmegen. I actually did it three times with various uh, student groups. And every time we got a nice working uh, prototype at the end of the road. This is one I worked on myself. I, uh, I cast like a rubber squeeze thingy and hooked it up to a barometric uh, sensor. So this whole project, it, it was a lot of fun to do. It, right now, the, like maybe some 20, 30 people worked on it. So it's, if ever anyone makes money of it, it's going to be really hard to track everybody down <laughs> to, to make sure that everybody gets reimbursed or at least named uh, as part of the, of the process. But it, it never made the next uh, step. It's kind of like, okay, so there's a prototype. What I, do I do now? Whom, whom do I approach to take the next uh, step on this one? I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, to be honest, I didn't work really hard on it either because, you know, new projects interfered and other things got uh, distracted me in uh, the process. Um, I wanted to tell this story as, a, as an example, uh, uh, like a real world example of what can happen when you take it broader and work in, in groups, right? and the challenges that come with that in particular. Oh, yeah, and to not end on a down note, I want to show some things. Not, this, this really warrants a, a presentation of its own, like the COVID res response in the medical field. That was such a big deal and that there's so many organizations that formed during that process and so many uh, uh, processes and protocols and ways of working developed in, in that brief time frame. I'm, yeah, no way I can cover that in a couple of slides, so I'm not, not going to try. One of the earliest things that people came up with was the Wuhan hook. Like somebody in China figured out if you take a hex key to a lighter, you can use the key to manipulate things so you don't have to touch them with, because touching things is like dangerous, people thought initially. And you can uh, clean it afterwards using the lighter. I was like, that's a cool idea. So I, I made one. It's easy enough, right? You get some tape, and there you go. Then I found it wasn't a very stable const construction. The tape was never tight enough, and you had wiggle room, and it was not real. It didn't work that well for manipulating things. So I designed and printed a 3D thingy, shared it too, which got us the hook of Holland, and <laughs> it, it worked better. <laughs> it was more stable that way. Uh, I was, and then I was like slowly committed to the track of touching things, which in the grand scheme of things wasn't the most important things because ultimately it was aerosols, right? It was like particles in the air rather than surfaces that were um, spreading uh, COVID. So it was like, if you want to touch surfaces, why don't, why not make something like that is a bit like an open glove? I tried that, it was kind of hard to manipulate with that, so I was like, maybe I need to make it more sturdy, like this, like cast a bit of silicone, have some rings where your fingers go in, and use it like that. This was also not very easy to manipulate, so ultimately I, I ended up with a device like this, where you can like, I actually brought it, so it, it's, it's here for a free interaction. You click the thing in place with magnet with an embedded magnet on a, on a holder, and then you can basically use it. You can dislodge it, use it for for all kinds of daily activities. The contaminated surface goes back flat on the on the holder, so you don't spread anything, and you can very focusedly clean the area that has been in contact with surfaces. Yeah, you basically have a, I was, after some training, I was able to use a keypad with it, so I could use it in, in stores to pay for things. 
And for people with like a fear of uh, contamination uh, or <laughs> any kind of OCD type, uh, this would still would be a good solution. And it's out there. I published it, I think, on Weevolver. I will put it on a GitHub later. And um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.